us. Every time we come to your presence is a thing of joy, is a thing of glory. And today again, we have come to be impacted. We have come to be empowered. We have come to be equipped. We have come to be inspired. We have come to be elevated. We have come to be spiritually fed so that we can be who you want us to be. As we look into your word, oh God, open our eyes of understanding. Amen. Thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. Amen. As we start our series by the grace of God, we start with this message of today. Divine provision for needy times. Now, for those who are new to our platform, uh, you will see if you look at your chart, the outline is on your chart. You can download a copy for yourself. So if you look at your Zoom and you look at the chat, the outline has been put on the chat and you can download a copy for yourself, a copy of the sermon outline. Divine provision for needy times. Let's look at John. Let's read together John chapter 2 from verses 1 to 11. John chapter 2 from verse 1 down to verse 11. And the third day, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples married. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said unto him, They have no wine. Jesus said unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? My hour is not yet come. His mother said unto them, unto the servants, Whatsoever is said unto you, do it. And there were set there six water pots of stone, after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three fakings apiece. Jesus said unto them, Fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said unto them, Draw out now, and bear unto the governor of the feast, and they bear it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew. The governor of the feast called the bridegroom and said unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine. And when men have, have well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. We know this story. Many of us have had this story even in Sunday school. It's been repeated over and over. But over the next four Sundays, we want to see tremendous things from this story and see what we can do from the story. As we go on, we understanding the setting of the story. Today, we want to look at divine provision for needy times. There is divine provision for needy times. Just know that God has promised to keep the believer alive in times of famine. That's his promise in Psalm 3, verse 19. Because it's good for us to know. No panic. We are living in a time of economic austerity. God has promised to keep you as a believer alive even in this time of austerity. My brother, relax. My sister, relax. Psalm 33 in verse 19. Psalm 33 verse 19. The scripture says, to deliver their soul from them. Who is he talking about? If you read from verse 18, behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him. So if you don't fear God, his eyes cannot be upon you. But if you fear God and you are righteous, his eyes are upon you. 
Upon them that hope in his mercy, if you are hoping in God's provision, you are hoping in God's mercy, his eye will be upon you. He will not abandon you. And what Amen. to deliver their soul from death. This year, it will deliver your soul from death. Amen. And to keep them alive in famine. Amen. In terms of you know, physical austerity and economic hardship, it will keep you alive in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And also, divine provision for an unexpected need that arises in the course of life's journey. Things have been okay. Things have been all right. But suddenly, surprises hit. God also will keep you. Here, we see a crisis that hit. There was crisis. We will see it as we go on in the story. There's still provision for those needy times. Whether it's a general needy time for the entire world, for the entire community, economic recession, economic difficulty, or whether it's a particular crisis that is uh, I mean, specifically, you know, limited to you as a person. Like here, it was limited to this. God will still make a provision. And he will make a provision for you in your needy times in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This passage, what do we learn from this John chapter 2? The first thing we learn from this John chapter 2 is adequate preparation and on assuming comportment. That's what we are learning. The Bible says, and the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee and the mother of Jesus was there. What do we learn? Jesus did not get crashed the wedding because his mother was a guest at the wedding. Have some courtesy. Life is teaching, the scripture is teaching us, have courtesy. The fact that they invited the mother of Jesus does not mean that Jesus has to be there. Have they invited him? So he will say, since they invited my mother, I'm going to go there, my brother. Have some courtesy. Have some honor. Don't get trash people's event. If you are not invited, stay out. How could they not, I mean, uh, have invited me. You don't dictate to the people who are holding the event. If they think you are important enough, they will invite you. If they don't think you are important enough, they may not invite you. And don't be angry about that. It's their event. So the Bible says, and the third day, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. She was invited, and she was there. But look at verse 2. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the moon. So, so Jesus was there not because of the mother. Jesus was there because he was personally invited and his disciples were personally invited. So that's important. So number one, the lesson we are learning, Jesus did not get crashed the wedding because his mother was a guest. He and his disciples were duly invited. The Bible says, and both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. Don't get crash people's events. If you have not been invited, stay away. Don't rubbish your honor. Through the unkind treatment you may be given. You know, sometimes some people, they think they are so important, they will get crash people's events. And when they are now treated roughly, they are spoken to roughly, they feel offended. How can they speak to me like that? Did they invite you? You get crushed, the event. And they are irritated. We didn't invite you, why did you come? And then the way they speak to you, you get offended. Why are you offended? Personal honor tells you that if you don't invite you, go away. It's not the end of the world. If they don't think they're important enough to invite you, well, I'm fine. You're important in other places. You may not be important to them. That's not the end of the world. And don't hang yourself because of that. Your worth is more than that. Amen? Amen. 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 Brethren, 
You are a believer. Learn to live with wisdom. See the scriptures. Jesus only went to where they invited him. When they don't invite him, he leaves them alone. And that one doesn't reduce, reduce who he is. You're not being invited to a particular event does not reduce who you are. You are still a child of God. You are still a wonderful sister. You are still a glorious brother. We still value you. They are not inviting you to that event does not mean that you don't, you, I mean, you are not somebody. You are somebody. Don't let invitation to an event or non-invitation to an event def de define your worth. You are worth more than that. Amen? Amen. Amen. Jesus went and he took his disciples because they were invited. He didn't go because the mother was invited. That's a different story. He went because both him and his disciples were invited. And he's telling us one lesson. Don't get crash people's events. If you are not invited, stay away. Be a man of honor. Be a man of dignity, a woman of dignity. Stay away. And don't be bitter about it. It's not the end of the world. Amen. 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 You know, there are people that do things in the church. I'm the pastor of the church and they don't even inform me. I don't get, I don't get uh, unnecessarily worked up. I'm their pastor. How can they be doing this? And they will not tell me. If they think that uh, they want to tell me, they'll tell me. If they think that it's not worth it, it's not worth it. It doesn't reduce me. And it doesn't affect my relationship with them. That's just the way life is. Don't be a person that is free. They invite you, praise God. They don't invite you, praise God. You know what Paul said? Food is good. But he said, food for the belly and the belly for food, both of them we perish. He says, whether we eat, are we the better? Or whether if we don't eat, are we the worse? What he's saying is that it doesn't really matter. We eat or we don't eat, it has no relevance. If you eat, it doesn't make you better. If you, are, if you don't eat, it doesn't make you worse. <laughs> it's neutral. And the way, same way you should treat things. Don't relax about life. Don't be worked up about things. Hey, they didn't miss any money. They didn't invite me. They only save you time so that you can use that time for maybe better things. Hey, they were doing wedding. They didn't even give, give me a wedding invitation. My sister, utilize your time to do better things. Don't be worked up by because of that. And don't say, I'm going to show them that even if they don't, they don't invite me, I will be there. No. Be a oh, no. Don't get crash. Amen. 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 I'm speaking to somebody there. I know. I'm speaking to somebody. Some of you have been offended because you were not invited before. You know, and some of you have said, I will show them that I know about the event and I will be there. And then they treat you anyhow. Then you get offended, you get wounded that they deliberately did that. They deliberately did that because they didn't invite you, but you forced yourself on them. They treat you anyhow. Be a woman of honor. Be a man of honor. If they don't invite you, stay away. And don't get bitter. It's just one of those things. It passes away. I pray the Lord is there to help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The people that were organizing this event, they made adequate preparation for the event. Why? Number one, look at the venue of the event. They prepared it. Number two, look at there were servants to serve. They organized it. There were containers to contain, you know, water, contain other things that they were organized. Even look at, the Bible talks about the governor of the feast, that is the MC, the master in charge of ceremony. They, they organize everything. And when we want to do things, we need to be adequately prepared. We need to organize. We don't assume. We make every preparation necessary. These people were organized. So like we said, the people organizing this wedding made adequate preparation for the wedding. Food and drink were available. You know, the man, for example, let me show you something in verse three. 
The Bible says, and when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said unto him, they have no wine. It's not that they have no wine. The wine has finished. Well, or somebody said, but pastors, the Bible says they have no wine. When you are reading, read everything. Look at verse 9. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew. The governor of the feast called the bridegroom. He called the person who they are doing the wedding. And verse 10, and said unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine. And when men have well drunk, that, that, that which was that which is worse, when, and when men have well drunk, that then, that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now, which means they've been drinking wine. But it has finished. And you know what this man is saying? He said, when they do wedding, the finest of wine, good taste, good, you know, good flavor in the mouth, everything smooth they give you. But you know, when people begin to drink and they begin to drink, if you have drunk a lot, eventually your taste bud becomes a little bit, it, is, it, it, it doesn't taste as much. So even if they give you something that is not as good as what they gave you before, you cannot distinguish because that taste bud has been so affected because of, of the drinking. That's what they say, that people will give the best and the finest of wine initially, but later they will give the cheap wine. But people don't know the difference because they've been drinking. So their taste bud doesn't know any difference anymore. But he says, this one I tasted is still as good as what you served in the beginning. Wow, you this bridegroom, you are trying. You didn't know it was water made wine. You understand? So it's not that there was no wine. There was wine. It's finished. It's finished. And here, these people prepared. They prepared. If you are going to do any event, prepare. That's important. The people organizing this wedding, they made adequate preparations for the wedding. Food and drinks were there. You know, for the invited guests, a well-prepared venue where they had it, it was there. I mean, master in charge of ceremonies, he was invited to coordinate everything in that. Servers and, and ushers, they planned, they adequately prepared. When we want to do things, let's prepare like that. We want to do conference, prepare like that. You want to run a local church, prepare in the morning. Your local church environment is okay. The toilet is clean. The auditorium is clean. The seats are well arranged. The system and everything. So that when people come to church, they enjoy God and they can go away and then say, wow, these people are organized. I was inspired. Let's learn. These people, adequate preparation they made for the wedding. The planners were unassuming in their comportment. They left no stone unturned in their preparations. There are many lessons we learn from this event. Number one, proper preparation prevents poor performance, all things being equal. What I mean, in Latin, they say ceteris paribus, which means if everything goes according to plan, proper preparation should make sure that there is a success of the event. But unfortunately, we live in a real world that some things can come to upset even your preparation and the event is not as successful as original plan because some issues happen, some things happen. But we're talking about if everything went according to plan, proper preparation should prevent poor performance. And if you want to be having good performance every time, it requires proper preparation. The choir want to sing, they don't want to sing off key, they need to prepare very well and practice. The preacher wants to be able to inspire people and go. He needs to prepare, I mean, very well before that. Start the scripture. You want to deliver fluently and impact people with your teaching. You need to prepare adequately. So today, one of the lessons we are learning is that in anything we do as believers, proper pre preparation is necessary so that we can deliver and have a good performance. Number two. Now, these people plan your wedding or other events you want to plan based on the resources available to you. 
Very important. There are some people, they will go and plan elaborate wedding that they cannot afford. There was somebody in Ancona many years ago. He went to Nigeria to go and marry. The marriage was so, so big. Commissioner for Education, Commissioner for this and that from the state, they were at that wedding. Big, big people. It was a big wedding in the eastern part of Nigeria, in Igbo land. Very big wedding. The person felt so big, and people thought this, this individual is coming from Italy, is coming from Europe. It was a big wedding. Even the wife was very happy. But before the wedding, they had already done all the papers and co. So within a month of the wedding, the wife came to join him in Ancona. They got to the, the wife got to the airport. He picked up the airport. And from the airport, the wife is asking, is this your car? He said, yes. The wife said, this is your car? Yes. <coughs> this old banger? Yes. With all the money you spent in Nigeria, you mean this is the kind of car you drive? Yes. From the airport already, the wife, the heart is already getting broken. They drove, they drove, they drove. They got to the house. He opened the door. Two bedroom house. You know, just like that. And the wife looked at it. It's not different from the houses we live in Nigeria now. It is your house? The man said yes. <laughs> Am I seeing double? That wedding we did in Nigeria. You mean this is your house? He said yes. Depression on setting. <laughs> <laughs> now this guy has gone to Nigeria for about two months to prepare for that particular wedding to make it great. For those two months, it didn't work, so no salary. For those two months, he didn't pay his rent. Mm. So one day the wife was at home, the landlord knocked. He was not in. She opened the door. The landlord asked, but she couldn't speak Italian. It's not in. Okay. The landlord went. Later, the landlord came back. And the landlord said, You have not paid rent for two months. The one was, You have not paid rent with that wedding. The woman went into depression. That is this my life? She thought she was marrying a millionaire from Europe. That marriage started on a bad note. My brother, my sister, plan your wedding or other events based on the resources available to you. Don't go and borrow money and get into debt. If you borrow money to buy a house, that's an appreciating asset. If you borrow money to buy land, that's an appreciating asset. If you borrow to be able to buy a car, not as a luxury, a car that can take you to work because work starts at 4 a.m., there is no bus at 4 a.m., you need to get to work. That's an income earning asset. That's okay. But don't go and borrow money to do funeral. Barrier, borrow money to do wedding. There is life after the funeral. There is life after the wedding. There are expenses to meet after those events have gone. Plan your events according to the resources that you have available. Don't plan. You know, there are some people, especially from where we come from, they plan their wedding based on the unseen gifts of imaginary benefactors. <laughs> Uncle will give me 100,000. Uh, that person, I think, if I estimate try, right, it should be minimum 200,000. That one will give me 50,000. And they're calculating that by the time the gifts that people are going to give me, I should be able to have about 5 million. And then I will, you will be disappointed. I spoke to somebody. He told me one time, 
And that, that's not recent to, I'm talking about five, six, maybe seven years ago when he got married. He said he got married in Benin. And then he said, he's not a member of our church, he's so, somewhere. And then he said, you know, I spent about six million on that wedding. I thought people were going to give me money. But by the time I counted all that people gave me, I'm not sure it came to one million. I was in God. <laughs> <laughs> you have calculated he's going to do societal wedding. All the money they will give him, he will eventually be able to cover the debt. He, he was disappointed. Oh. He was way down. My brother, my sister, don't plan your wedding on the unseen gifts of imaginary benefactors. What did I say? <laughs> ah, say it on say it. What, what did I say? Don't, Don't plan your wedding your kids, your and your and your and your and your You will you will cry. Oh. <laughs> Don't plan your wedding on the unseen gifts of imaginary benefactors. People will disappoint. They're going to tell you that wedding was great. They don't have a hand in it too. When they hear you owe money, they are the first one that says, stupid man. How can he be borrowing money to do that kind of wedding? They are the real ones that were telling you it was a great wedding, but they are the ones that will tell you that you were stupid for borrowing money to do that. Be wise. If you plan your wedding based on the unseen gifts of, of imaginary benefactors, it leads to massive disappointments. People who have tried it, they've always regretted. They start their, their, their marriage life with a lot of debt hanging on their neck and they are wondering. Say, I didn't plan so. How, how could you have planned so? You should have known. I pray the Lord himself, he will help us in Jesus' name. Amen. So these people planned. They planned the wedding. Everything was okay. They did it as you. They turned every stone. They make sure that the person to coordinate the wedding, the master in charge is there, the venue, everything is okay. The containers to contain, you know, for water, for drinks, for everything is there. You know, the servers are there, the ushers are there. Everything they prepared and they gave the necessary invitation to the people that they wanted to come to the wedding. Very, very good. What are we learning? We're learning about organization. We're learning about preparation. We're learning about how to handle the events in life. We want to do conference, this is what to do. You want to do a day program in the church, it's telling you this is what to do. Number two, let's look at abiding possibilities of unexpected crisis. What do I mean? In an ideal world, proper preparation should ensure that things go smoothly. However, we don't live in an ideal world. We live in a real world where there are abiding and endless possibilities of unexpected crisis. Things can go wrong. And you need to understand, unfortunately, there is a law that is called Murphy's Law. And Murphy's Law is a constant reality in our real world. You know what Murphy's Law says? Murphy's Law says, Anything that can go wrong will go wrong at precisely the wrong time. You are taking train every day. That train is always 10 a.m. and it's always punctual. Do you know that the day you have interview and you want that train to be punctual so that you can make your interview, unfortunately, is that day the train will be late. You'll be late for the interview. I said, what kind of a train is this? This train has never been late. Anything that can go wrong will go wrong at precisely the wrong time. That's why you need to understand that law and plan ahead. You are going for that interview. You should take the train of 10 a.m. My brother, take the train of 9 a.m. So that unexpected crisis does not affect you. Plan ahead. Murphy's law is real. Anything that can go wrong will go wrong at precisely the wrong time. 
You know, sometimes you have always been punctual. You take your train at the same time. But one thing happened a particular day, and, the, and every time you get to the train station, the train is meant to be 9 a.m. The train never comes 9 a.m. It will be always be 9 10, 9 15, 9 20. Retardo. The day you are late, that day, the train will be punctual. You get to the train station, the train has gone. Say, what kind of a train is this? I, I always come to the train station on time, and the train is never late. It's today, only today, only today that I came late. The train came on time. Murphy's Law, my brother. Murphy's Law, my sister. Anything that can go wrong will go wrong at precisely the wrong time. You need to understand that and plan your life accordingly. Know that that's the real world in which we live. Amen? Amen. Amen. For the planners of the wedding, we are told, and when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said unto him, they have no wine. The wine had finished. They ran out of wine at the wedding. The question is, but they prepared well? Yes. Why did they run out of wine? We need to ask ourselves. Why do people run out of resources? We can ask. Why do people run out of provision? We can ask. Sometimes people run out of provision because of lack of wisdom, waste, like the bodyguard son. He took his inheritance, a lot of money. He went to the far country. And the Bible says he wasted his goods with riotous living. And the time came when a famine arose, it began to be a want. So everything finished because he foolishly frittered away what he had. So sometimes when there is lack, there are reasons behind it. So in this particular case, we need to examine why did the wine finish? Now the Bible doesn't tell us that. Now when you are a preacher, Sometimes, remember that preaching is to affect people's life. Preaching is to give them wisdom. Preaching is to help them when they meet practical situations in life, they know how to handle it. So there are times that we look at the passage and we bring some things, some possibilities. The Bible didn't say it. The Bible just said that when they wanted wine, there was no wine. They have run out of wine. He didn't tell us why they ran out of wine. But we can now say about the possibilities. How could they have run out of wine? What was the crisis? What were the things that could have happened? And that's what I want to do now that uh, as we look at it. They ran out of wine. They ran out of resources. There are endless possibilities and reasons why this could have occurred. Let's examine a few of these possibilities. This is not in the Bible. But if wine finished, there are the reasons why they were finished. Because these people prepared adequately. So why could this kind of thing have happened? Number one, maybe mistaken on the estimation of the needed provision. You know, 100 people are coming. And you think that, okay, 100 people, if we cook a bag of rice, it should be sufficient. But you will know that a bag of rice, 25 kilos, will not feed the 100 people. That's an underestimation. There will be shortage. So it's possible that there's a mistaken underestimation of the needed provision for the wedding. And therefore, their preparation was inadequate for the event. In that case, they will surely run out of wine because they did not prepare adequately. And it's not that they didn't want to prepare adequately, their estimation was faulty. That can be done. That mistake can be made. Anybody can make it. And that's one reason. Number two, there could be a bigger turnout than originally expected and planned for. Maybe they planned for 100 people at the wedding. 150 turned out. And the provision that they made was for 100. But unfortunately, 150 people turned out. You know, they will run out. And that's possible. 
That's very, very possible. Number three, you know the Bible, if you look at John chapter two, because there's something that was said there. John chapter two, in verse nine, uh, in verse six, and there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews. If you know what that means, Jewish tradition, after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, I think that those pots might have been seven. Seven is the number of perfection. And when Jews want to do this kind of a thing, they do a lot of things that are symbolic. I'm not saying, the Bible didn't say it's seven. Remember, I'm telling you from an understanding of Jewish you know, culture, Jewish this, that those pots, they might have been seven to signify perfection after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three fuckings apiece. That's the volume of the, you know, of the, of the pots. Now, if there were seven pots, why is there remaining six? Maybe one has broken. They put wine in all those pots. You know, it's not that time is not like here when you serve Coca Cola and it's in a bottle and it's in a can. At that time, the wine is put in pots. You need wine, they take from it, they pour out to you. It is not bottled wine. Amen. So Amen. those pots are meant for wine. <coughs> wine must have been in those pots. But eventually, the wine finished. They served people and it finished. So what are we saying? One or two of the pots could have broken and the wine inside them spilled out. So that the remaining, is it sufficient? You know, is it sufficient? If six pots of wine, 10 pots of wine was, of, were to be sufficient for 100 people and two pots broke and when they broke, how do you save the wine? The wine just spilled on the floor. You, you wash the, you sweep them away and you wash the floor. The remaining eight will not be sufficient. And that's possible. Accidents are a constant reality in life. Mistakes are ever present with us. Those are unexpected crises. Nobody plans for that, but they are caught. So what happens? There will be insufficiency. Anyway, the wine will not be sufficient. But number four, there could have been activities of greedy people and others. <laughs> Maybe some people drank more than their sheer fear, than their fear share. Understand? Maybe they've already calculated, okay, if everybody drinks maybe three cups of wine, then we are expecting 100. So we need to prepare for 300 cups. 300 cups will be like this. Then somebody comes and thinks that free free wine. I, I, I need to drink. I'm going to drink the one that will last me for the next one week. And he sits there, drinks one cup, two cups, three cups, four cups, five cups, six cups. He's just drinking. Of course, it's not going to be enough because that individual is drinking more than his own fear share that he should drink. So somebody is going to suffer need. It could be like that. Or you know, like we, we, we do. Somebody is, is preparing, somebody is doing funeral or is doing wedding in our culture. And there are some people, when they come there, they'll go and take container, pack meat, boom, 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 and then they will hide it somewhere. That one they're going to take home after the event is over. But the person that is doing the funeral and doing the wedding, he has already calculated these are the number of people coming and they need this amount of meat and coke and he has calculated. But because of these hoarders, because of these people that are packing meat and hiding to take home after, there will be shortage. That's activities of greedy people, activities of others. So maybe some people drank more than their fair share of, of, of that. Maybe the people that are eating six pieces of big meat or cutting some away in secrecy to take home after the wedding. But anyway, there are endless possibilities where there could be, why there could be shortage. But here we have shortage. So what are we saying? My brethren, what we are saying is that sometimes in life, unexpected crisis will happen and spoil all your preparation. 
and your adequate preparation will now become as if you are not adequately prepared. Nullifies all your preparation. There are abiding possibilities. And you need to plan, you know, you need to have, you know, a mitigating plan for those events. We live in a real world. It does happen. You need to understand that. Amen. 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 I remember when we used to have conference in Maenza and we are phoning the brethren. Let's know how many are coming from your place. And brethren will not answer. And we don't want food to be wasted, especially like salad. So we'll prepare, we'll buy enough salad. We will estimate because they will not give us. And sometimes the turnout is more than what we have prepared for. After one day, the salad has finished. And unfortunately, many of the shops have closed for holiday because it's August. And then people will say, Pastor, you are not prepared. How can you do this? I mean, how can this be that salad has finished? My brother, we prepare for those we think are coming. But unfortunately, there were more people that came. The churches could have helped us by telling us how many people are coming. We would have prepared adequately. But we, we thought, okay, maybe five people will come from that church. Then 15 came. How will there not be shortage? There will be shortage because the turnout is bigger than what we prepared for. So we don't know what happened in this particular case. What we know is that there was a crisis. Wine finished. And yet, the ceremony was not over. So another thing we are learning in life is that there are abiding possibilities of unexpected crises that can happen, that can mess up your events, that can mess up your celebration, that can mess up your preparation. You need to have plan to mitigate against that. And I pray the Lord himself, he will help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's go back to that John chapter 2. John chapter 2. From verse 1. And the third day, there was a man, a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called, and his disciples told him, marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said unto him, they have no wine. Jesus said unto her, woman, what have I to do with thee? My hour is not yet come. His mother said unto the servant, whatsoever he said unto you, do it. So when these people said there is no wine, the mother of Jesus reached out to Jesus and said, these people have gone into a crisis. Please help them out. They have no wine. Do a miracle. Rescue the situation. And Christ said, you know that I didn't come here for this kind of miracle. They came, they invited me to witness the wedding and I've come to witness the wedding. They didn't invite me as a miracle worker. The mother turned to the servant, don't worry. Jesus didn't come. He came as an invited guest to witness the marriage. He didn't come as a miracle worker. But anyhow, whatsoever he tells you, do it. He will, he will resolve the issue. You know the question this day. Have you invited Jesus to the special events of your life? You never can tell what will go wrong. Thank God that this person doing the wedding, he invited Jesus and the disciples. He couldn't have seen that I'm going to run into a problem. But he just invited him. But now when problem came, the miracle worker was there. And I'm asking you also, have you invited Jesus to the special events in your life? You know why? Things can go wrong. And when things go wrong, he will be there for you. Amen. Amen. I remember several years ago, 1991 to be precise, when myself and my wife we were getting married. Thank God we invited Jesus to that wedding. Do you realize that on the day of the wedding, my wife had a spiritual attack 
in the church. <laughs> it was big. Massive spiritual attack on the day of our wedding in the church while the service was going on. But because we invited Jesus to that event, he took control. Man. He rescued us. Hallelujah. But my brother, invite Jesus to the special events of your life. You never can tell. Say, this is the day of my joy. I'm going to invite him. Things might not go as you have prepared. Crisis might come. Things may go wrong. But if you invite him, when the crisis comes, you will have help. Thank God this person, I mean, that is doing this wedding, he invited Jesus and his disciples to the wedding. And when crisis came, the mother of Jesus would say, well, unfortunately, they were not expecting any crisis, but crisis has come. Please come to the rescue. And so I said, my time is not yet. I didn't come here to be a miracle worker. Said, Don't worry, still help them. You are here anyway. Doing so, that is inviting Jesus to the special events in your life is the best thing you can do because when the wine finishes, he will be there to help you. He was there to help this person. Have you? Do you know it's not only this? That's a principle in the Bible. Second Kings chapter six. Second Kings chapter six. You are learning a major principle in the Bible. Anywhere you go, go with Jesus. Crisis may happen. He will rescue you. Amen. Second Kings chapter six. Let me read it to you from verse one. And the source of the prophets said unto Elisha. Behold now, the place where we dwell with thee is too straight for us. Let us go, we pray thee, unto Jordan, and take thence every man a beam, and let us make us a place there where we may dwell. And the answer, go ye. They said, the premises is too choking. We need more space. We need more, you know, buildings. And they were asking, because he was their, their leader, they are asking him permission. Are you going to permit us so that we can go to River Jordan where there's, I mean, good forests and good trees, and we cut down trees, bring, and then we build more premises? And Elijah said, that's, that's a good initiative. Go. Verse 3. And one said, be content, I pray thee, and go with thy servants. And he answered, I will go. They don't need him to cut down trees, but they invited him. One of them said, please, sir, can you accompany us when we are going? And Elijah looked at him. All right, I will go. Verse 4. So you went with them. When you promise, fulfill your promise. He told them I will go. And the Bible says in verse 4, so he went with them. And when they came to Jordan, they cut down wood. Elijah was not cutting down wood. They are the one that was cutting down wood. Verse 5. But as one was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water, and he cried and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. And the man of God said, Where fell it? And he showed him the place. And he cut down a stick and cast it in thither, and the iron did sweep. Therefore said he, Take it up to thee. And he put out his hand and took it. You know what? They invited Elisha to come along with them. They were not expecting there would be a crisis. They were not expecting there would be a crisis. But life always happens. What did I say? Life always life. happens. Life always happens. Crisis happened. The accident fell into the water. Thank God Elisha was there. Master, look at what has happened. He rectified it. If you invite Jesus, when you run into a problem, the miracle worker is there. If you invite Elisha to follow you, when you run into a problem, Elisha is there to rescue you. Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. You are learning a lesson in life. Anywhere you go, go with Jesus. Don't go anywhere without Jesus. Because anything can happen. 
But if you go anywhere with Jesus, there is no need for panic. Because if there is a crisis, the person that will take care of the crisis is with you. Mark chapter 4 from verse 35. And the same day, when the evening was come, when, when it was evening, he said unto them, let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind. And the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. And he was in the inner part of the ship, asleep on the pillow. And they awoke and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace be still, and the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. Are you journeying to the other side? Take Jesus with you. Go along with Jesus. All I know is smooth. There is no problem. How about if there is a storm, a great storm? How about if there is a wind, a fierce and violent wind? But because Jesus is in the boat, we can solve that problem. That's one of the lessons we learned from Cana of Galilee. Jesus was invited. When the wine finished, he was there to solve the problem. He invite Jesus every event in your life. If crisis happens, you are covered. I pray the Lord Himself will help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, like we said, have you persuaded Elisha to go along with you in going to cut down trees at Jordan? When the enemy falls into the river, it will be there to perform a miracle. Are you traveling life's journey in the boat, going to the other side? Travel Jesus. Let him be with you. Let him accompany you. Because if a storm arises, he will be there to help you. The mother of Jesus turned to the servants and told them, whatsoever he says unto you, do it. Whatsoever he says unto you, do it. Let's see. John chapter 2, verse 5. His mother said unto the servants, Whatsoever he said unto you, do it. Let's see what Jesus told them, whether they did it or not. Verse 6. And there was said there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three fakins apiece. Jesus said unto them, Fill the water pots with water. What did Jesus tell them? Fill the water pot with water. What did the mother of Jesus tell the servants? Anything he said to do, do it. Now, Jesus has told them, fill the water pot with water. Mary has told them, whatsoever he tells you do. Let's now see whether they did. In verse 7. And they filled them up to the brim. Okay. I think these people 100% mark. No questioning. Mary said, whatever he tells you to do, no question. Just do it. And Christ said, all right. Go and fill the And they filled them to the brim. <laughs> verse, two, verse 8. And he said unto them, draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast. And what did they do? And they bear it. They bear it. said, okay, go and take part of that water and take it to the master in charge. Didn't he say, for what? It's water now. We just we just put the water there. You told us to put water. We put water. I want to hard whatsoever he says unto you, do it. What's your problem? Bear from that and take it to the God of the feast. You just obey. Whatsoever he said unto you, do it. And the Bible says here, yeah, and they bear it. No questioning. Verse 9. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was. But the serpents which drew the water knew. 
The governor of the feast called the bridegroom and said unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine. And when men have, have well drunk, then he will bring that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. He didn't know it was water that was turned wine. Obedience. The water has turned wine. The servant would have said, I will be embarrassed now. The man will ask me, who told you to bring water? Did I ask for water? You'll be embarrassing me. No. Whatsoever he says unto you, do it. He will take care. He will take care. You know, that's the problem with many of us. God is telling us, do this. You are using your brain to adjust it. How about if I do it and nothing happens? How about if I do it and they challenge me? How about if I do it and this one? He has already told you. Go to that village. You will see an ass tied. Lose that ass and bring it up to me. Ah, but if they call us thieves, if anybody challenges you, just tell them the Lord has need of it. You will solve the problem. Is that not what they did? Yes, sir. Were they accused of stealing? No. He will go before you and solve the problem. What? Simple faith. Whatsoever he tells you, do it. Let me show you another passage where that same word was said. Genesis chapter 41. Genesis 41. You are learning a lot today. A lot how to manifest your faith. Genesis 41, in verse 55. Egypt was in crisis. It was a time of famine. Trouble in the nation. They went to go and meet Pharaoh. The emperor in the empire, the king of Egypt. And this is what Pharaoh told them. Genesis 41, verse 55. And when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh or for bread. And Pharaoh said unto all the Egyptians, Go unto Joseph. What he said to you, do. What he said to you, do. Pharaoh said, I don't have a, a solution to this problem, but go to Joseph. What he says to you, do. Mary says, I don't have a solution to this problem. Go to Jesus. Whatsoever he tells you, do. When they did what Jesus told them to do, was there a solution? Yes, sir. Read this Genesis. When they did what Joseph told them to do, there was a solution. Whatsoever he tells you to do, do it. When Egypt did what Joseph told them to do, there was a solution. They lived through that famine. They didn't perish. Whatever he tells you to do, do it. You might be in crisis. There will be a solution. He has a word. And that's important. So Mary told the disciples, I mean, the servants, whatsoever he said unto you, do it. The way out of crisis for Egypt is to do whatsoever Joseph tells them to do. And they did. The way out of our problem, the way out of our crisis is to do whatever the Lord tells us to do. You have toiled all the night and unfortunately you caught nothing. And then he tells you, launch out into the deep. If you will do it, abundance is coming. You Amen. have toiled all the night and you caught nothing. And he says, children, have you any meat? And they say, no. Throw your net on the right side and you will catch. When they threw their net on the right side, John chapter 21, the Bible says they caught multitude of fishes. You know what we are saying? Whatsoever he says unto you, do it. What do we learn? Mark chapter, look at Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 3. Whatsoever he says unto you, do it. What has God been telling you? How has God been leading you? Some of you, you are missing your blessing because you are not responding to divine word. He's telling you, this is what to do. But fear has frozen you. You are not doing what he says you should do. And you are not getting the results you expect. Whatsoever he says unto you, do. launch out into the deep. If you will launch out into the deep, abundance is coming. Throw your mm -hmm. net on the right side. If you throw your net on the right side, you will catch. Look at Mark chapter 1. And he entered again into the synagogue. And there was a man there which had a withered hand. So this was a man with a paralyzed hand. 
Look at verse, uh, look, look at look at the scriptures there in uh, verse five. And when he had looked round, round about on them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts, he said unto the man, stretch forth thy hand. Whatsoever he says unto you, do it. Mm -hmm. This is a man with the withered hand. He could have said, but you know my hand is withered. I cannot stretch it. Whatsoever he says unto you, do it. Even when it seems impossible. Even when it seems you are incapable. Whatsoever he says unto you, do it. So he told this man, stretch forth your hand. And he stretched it out. And his hand was restored whole as the other one. <laughs> Whatsoever he tells you do, the crisis will be over. Whatsoever he tells you, healing will manifest. Whatsoever he tells you do, deliverance will come. Whatsoever Amen. he tells you do, victory will come. Whatsoever he tells you do, you will be lifted to the platform of dominion. Amen. As we go from this Sunday worship, whatsoever he says unto you, you will do it. Jesus' name. Amen. These are the servants, what to do? They did it. They reported back to him. We have filled the pot with water. He performed the miracle and solved the problem. This is assisting provision from the unparalleled Christ. Who else can do that? Who else can turn this terrible situation into a situation of testimony and joy? Only Jesus. That's why we called him the unparalleled Christ. Look at John chapter 21. John chapter 21. John chapter 21. Unparalleled Christ. And in your life, it will be the unparalleled Christ. Amen. John chapter 21 verse 5. Then Jesus said unto them, Children, have you any meat? They answered him, No. Verse 6. And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. You see what they did? They cast their fall, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. They were where there was abundance, but they didn't realize it. But Jesus knew they were where there is abundance, but they didn't know. Then he told them, cast your net on the right side. They just obeyed. Abundance came. Verse 7. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said unto Peter, It is the Lord. It was sharp. Only Jesus can do this kind of miracle. Only Jesus can know that we have abundance on the right side of the ship. Even we that are fishermen, we didn't know. This is Jesus. And it was Jesus. It's your parallel Christ. Only him could do that kind of miracle. Maybe in your life there is crisis. Maybe in your life there is a crisis. In your marriage there is a crisis. In your career there is a crisis. In your academics there is a crisis. In your health there is a crisis. In your social life there is a crisis. In your financial life there is a crisis. Only Jesus, only Jesus can bring you a solution. And that Jesus is here today. He has been invited to this meeting. He is here like he was at the Cana of Galilee, and they will meet your need. There is a system provision from the unparalleled Christ. As he made that provision, he will, as he made that crisis, he will meet your he will meet your need. As he made the provision, he will make a provision for you. I don't care the kind of crisis you are going through. Today is a day of deliverance. Today is a day of solution. Today is a day of victory. Today is your day of power. And the Lord Himself, He will do it in Jesus' name. So John told. He told Peter, it is the Lord. Only him can do this. You know, when he still the storm, he said, what manner of man is this? That even the sea and the, and the winds obey him. No, it's only Jesus that can do that. Only Jesus that the sea and the storms and the wind obey him. Only Jesus. He's the unparalleled Jesus. And he said today, he solved that problem for them. He's the unparalleled Christ. He's the one is the only one that can solve the problem. This assisting provision from the unparalleled Christ is the only one that can do such things. Jesus is the helpful and compassionate Savior who will come true for you in your hour of crisis. Are you there? Amen. Passing to the other side. Unfortunately, there's a great storm. He's the only one that can come true for you. Peace Amen. Wine has finished. 
Why represents joy? Why represents celebration? And it has finished. It has finished in your marriage. It has finished in your career. It has finished in your finances. It has finished in your job. Only Jesus can bring back that joy, that can bring back that celebration, that can create a new wine, even and solve that crisis. And today we'll do it. What crisis are you going through? What crisis in your marriage? What crisis in your finances? What crisis in your health? What crisis? Jesus has been invited there today. And because he has been invited, there's a system provision for that on parallel Christ. Rise up and let us pray and tell the Lord and say, I know that oh, you, Jesus, there's a divine provision for your faithfulness to God. There's a divine provision for my to God. There's a divine provision for my needy time. There's a divine provision for my needy time. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your compassion. He's here to help you. He's here to bless you. Your brother, begin to pray. Begin to pray. He's here for you. He's here to bless you. He's here to help you. Divine provision. Divine provision. Divine provision. My brother, divine provision. You are with me. You are the one that can make people with this. In the name of Jesus. Assisting provision. Divine provision for all the time. What crisis are you going through? Christ is in your hands. Only say you can help me. Only you can deliver. Divine provision. For that, for that problem here. Problem with your in law, problem challenges here and there. In but it's Google to the perfect social go, Baba. Lead us, O oh God, my family, O oh God. Be the director of all institutions, O oh God. In the name of Jesus Christ, O oh God, you're the only one that have answer to all needs, O oh God. That is why God I fight to Baba. To my family, oh to Lord over everything, to direct our fellow God, Baba. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, O oh, I depend upon you, O oh God. I depend upon you day and night, O oh God, Baba. Provide all the necessary needs to go, Baba. Meet our needs to go, Baba. Oh, the time of inadequacy you call you provide the call. The time of shortage you call you provide the call, Baba. Baba, I pray your voice to go. Whatsoever you ask me to do, Baba, give me that call. That I try to obey and do for God. Because it's something that I say, there's no other way. Only to obey and trust in Jesus. Sunday worship. The first of a series that we're going to look at in this John chapter 2. Verses 1 to 11 is going to be awesome. Lord, we thank you for the things you have taught us how to manage life. If they have not invited us to a place, we should be men and women of honor. Stay away. Don't let anybody rubbish your honor. And we have seen that Jesus did not get crashed. There are proper behaviors in, in life. Be somebody that is courteous, somebody that has etiquette. Some, somebody that is reasonable. Heavenly Father, as you are teaching us so that we can be better behaved, oh Lord, let these lessons also remain with us in Jesus' name. Amen. We have learned adequate preparation for whatever we want to do. We shouldn't take things with loose hand. We shouldn't be assuming. We should be unassuming. Be diligent. Be focused. Prepare well. We want to do exam. Prepare well. We want to do an event. Prepare well. Yes, crises do, do happen. But when crisis happens, we'll be tackling it. But we need to prepare well as if nothing is going to happen. But when anything happens, Jesus was invited to the wedding. When crisis came, he was there to solve the problem. You have been invited to this meeting of today. And any crisis that is represented in your people's life, crisis in finance, crisis in their career, crisis at the place of work, 
crisis in their marriage, crisis socially, crisis in their health, in their health. Oh Lord, I ask for assisting provision from heaven to solve the challenge in Jesus' name. Amen. I speak into your life today that water will turn into wine. Amen. That wine has been finished, there will be a replenishment. Amen. There will be a miracle turning water into wine. The Amen. celebration that exists in your life is coming back. Amen. The joy of spirit in your life is coming back. Amen. The provision of the spirit in your life is going is going to be replaced and replenished. Amen. The Lord Amen. is going to intervene Amen. in your in your in your situation, and Amen. things are going to turn around in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And only you can do it. Yes. Just say, only Jesus will know that there's abundance on the right side of the ship. This is the Lord. What manner of man that even the winds and the waves, only Jesus. Oh Lord, you are the unparalleled Christ. And I pray that you will show forth your power on behalf of your people today in Jesus' name. Because Amen. you have been invited to this service. Every problem represented, physical, spiritual, social, intellectual, I bring those problems, I take authority over them, and I bring the power of the Lord Jesus to, to bear on those problems. Those problems are solved right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Go home and celebrate your victory. Amen. Amen. Lord, we thank you because we know you have answered. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' mighty and victorious name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.